Man, so many of you have asked about Mark and have expressed that you're praying for him. And so, man, I want you to know we are overwhelmed by your love and, and by your kindness this last week. And uh, we don't know anything yet. They're sending him to a specialist on Tuesday, so we should have some answers this coming week. And so just thank you so much for your prayers. Um, one of the men yesterday, you know, we have a Saturday morning service, and then we have a 9 o'clock Spanish service, and then we have this service. And yesterday in our, in our morning service, one of our regular attenders uh, comes up to me, and his, his name's Mike, just a great guy. He, he works in our, our feeding ministry, and he comes up to me, and he says, Pastor Brian, I want you to know, we got this. So we got this. I want you to know that as a church, we got this in prayer. He said, you don't have to worry about this at all. We got this. And so I knew what he meant. I knew he meant that God has this. But uh, I just appreciate it so much. And thank you. Uh, we'll keep you in the loop. And, and we'll keep you informed as we know things. And uh, God's got this. Amen. And God's got not only this. God's got what you're going through as well. And so we trust him. Take your Bibles or your iPhones or your iPads and turn with me to Mark chapter 14 today. So let me ask you, when you were a kid, did you ever persistently ask your parents for something for which they consistently told you no? (laughs) In other words, you asked for something, please, please, and they know, and please, please, and they know. Um, Probably most of us did that. If you're a parent... You're probably familiar with that, right? Kids wanting something and, uh, and us having to tell them no. Paul Harvey, who's the, the, the great radio storyteller, some of us, I'm probably dating myself, some of you younger ones might say, who in the world is Paul Harvey? But, but those who are my age are familiar with Paul Harvey, a radio storyteller, and Paul Harvey told the story about a mother who went to the grocery store with her three-year-old. So knowing her three-year-old, before she walks in the store, she looks at him and she says, now I'm going to tell you right now, we're not going to buy chocolate chip cookies. So don't even ask me for chocolate chip cookies. So they go in the store and she picks up the three-year-old and she puts him in the cart and she begins to walk down the aisles. And after a few moments, they find themselves in the cookie aisle. And so the three-year-old says, Mommy, can I please have some chocolate chip cookies? And she looked at him and said, I told you before we walked in the store, we're not going to buy chocolate chip cookies. So they went on and, you know, walked through the store, you know, filled their cart up, and about 15 minutes later, walked back through the cookie aisle again. And the three-year-old says, Mommy, can I please have chocolate chip cookies? And Mommy said, I told you beforehand, I'm not going to buy you chocolate chip cookies today. So they go on and so finish their shopping and get to the checkout place. And the three-year-old realizing that his last opportunity is fast approaching. He looks at his mom with all kinds of people around and yells out, In Jesus' name, may I please have chocolate chip cookies. And Paul Harvey says that mom didn't buy him chocolate chip cookies, but they walked out that day with 23 boxes of chocolate chip cookies that other people around them purchased for that three-year-old boy. All of us know what it's like to ask for something and not get it. The passage that we're studying today three times We find Jesus making a specific request to his father, making a specific well-known petition, saying, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And three times the father answers him, not in the way that he asked, but the father answers not with Jesus' human will, but with the Father's divine will. The passage that we're going to read in just a few moments is profoundly theological. But it's not only profoundly theological, it's deeply practical. The, the, the mystery of the struggle between the humanity and the deity of Jesus are clearly, is clearly seen 
in this passage. And so today as we study this, I not only want you to see this from a, from a profound, theological, deep, biblical, truth point of view, but I want us to end in a very practical way. Seeing ourselves, it's interesting that Vicki led us in that song talking about being in the garden after Jesus' resurrection. Well, today I want to put each of us in the garden before Jesus' crucifixion. Because I submit to you today that every single one of us will have times in our life in which we will have a garden of Gethsemane moments. A moment in which we will profoundly and passionately and deeply ask God to do something, expecting God to respond. So if you have your Bibles, we'll put it up on the screen. We're in Mark chapter 14. Beginning in verse 32, I'll read 10 verses. You can follow along, read with me, whatever you want to do. Verse 32, Mark 14, 32. And they went to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to the 12, and, you know, sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter, James, and John. We saw that just a couple of weeks ago. Remember he took Peter, James, and John up to the Mount of Transfiguration. They were kind of like the, the, the inner circle. And he took Peter, James, and John with him just a little further. And it says, And Jesus began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he looks at the three of them and he says, My soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here. And watch. In other words, he says, hey, stay here and pray with me. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And Jesus said, Abba, Father, what an intimate, an intimate term. Daddy, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. God, you can do anything. Is there any way that, that, that we could find a different solution to this sin problem? All things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Theologians have debated for years what was in the cup, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. But then Jesus says, not what I will, but what you will. Would you read that phrase with me? That's such a powerful phrase. Read that with me today. Yet not what I will, but what you will. Okay, that was about a third of you. Let's all read it together, okay? Yet not what I will, but what you will. So Jesus then comes back and he finds Peter, James, and John sleeping. And he says to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could, could you not watch with me one hour? And he makes this great statement that applies to us. It's so true. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Can I get an amen to that? How many of us would say, man, I have the best intentions sometimes, but my spirit is willing, but my flesh gives in. You ever, you ever fell asleep reading your Bible? Come on, I know you have, all right? You, you ever laid in bed and said, okay, I, I'm going to spend some time praying, and man, it didn't find yourself, it didn't take long, and you were sound asleep. That's what happened to the disciples. And so Jesus leaves them, and again, he goes away, and this time he prayed the same words, and again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And they didn't know what to answer him. I, I, I mean, what would you say to Jesus if he asked you to pray and he walks away for a little bit of time and he comes back and, man, you're snoring logs. Man, you're just out. And he comes back and just kind of looks at you. I mean, I mean, what would you say? There's nothing to say. They, they didn't know what to answer him. And he came a third time. So he goes and prays, and the third time he comes back to them and says, are you still sleeping Take your rest. It's enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. My betrayer 
is at hand. Would you pray with me today? Father, thank you so much for the example of Jesus. Father, thank you for allowing us to see, Lord, such an intimate conversation between God the Son and God the Father. And Father, I pray that we would not only see and understand and feel this theologically, but Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand the truth of this in our own souls. Help us to understand the spiritual battle that was taking place, the spiritual battle here that ultimately accomplished our salvation. But Lord, help us to relate with the humanity of Jesus Christ and help us to respond just as he responded. And Lord, I do pray if there's somebody here today that Lord is struggling with their faith and they've never placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that today would be that day, Lord, that they would fully submit themselves to him, recognize him as Lord, and trust him as their personal Savior. And Lord, for those of us who are struggling with the battles of life, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to respond like our supreme example, Jesus Christ. Help us to follow him, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, as I mentioned, this scene takes place in the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane, if you've been to Jerusalem, is just across the, the Kidron Valley. And so the, the city of Jerusalem is here, and there's a, there's a valley that's the Kidron Valley. And just across the Kidron Valley is the Mount of Olives. And on the slope of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. And so the garden is, is some 200 yards or so from, from the walls of Jerusalem. As, as these events transpire, it's probably Thursday of Passion Week. So this is, this is crucifixion week. It's also the week of the Passover as Jesus has just celebrated the Passover with his disciples. If, if you're familiar with the Gospel of John, the upper room discourse has already taken place. The, the high priestly prayer of John chapter 17 has already taken place. And, and Jesus grabs his disciples and, and, and they leave the upper room and begin to make their way towards Jerusalem. And to get to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, you wouldn't go down the valley, but you would kind of weave your way around to one side and, and come back to the city of Jerusalem. And so as they were making their way down the Mount of Olives, he paused with, with, with the 12 disciples and said, stay here. And then he asked three of them, Peter, James, and John, to accompany him as he approached and then entered the Garden of Gethsemane. So, so as all of this has transpired, once again, it's Thursday of Passover week, Jesus has preached his last sermon. He's performed his last miracle other than the resurrection. He celebrated his last Passover with the disciples. And he's about to embark on this part of his journey, this part of our journey in which he would give his life for us. And so as he enters the Garden of Gethsemane, he asks Peter, James, and John to stay at the entrance of the garden, and he goes further in, not wanting to be disturbed while he prays. As we read this, I want you to see that, that, that in these verses, the Bible gives us a glimpse of something that we normally don't get. And so the, rare is the occasion that you and I are able to uh, hear and see and understand the personal thoughts, the personal feelings of Jesus. The Bible doesn't tell us a lot about his personal thoughts and feelings. For example, wouldn't you love to know what his favorite color was? Probably he'd look and say, all of them, because I created all of them, right? Or wouldn't you love to know what his favorite food is? I mean, so, so when he went for fast food, what did he order? You know, I mean, I mean, what was it that he ordered? The Bible doesn't tell us. I sit back and think, man, I'd love to know what he was thinking when, when the religious leaders falsely accused him. I mean, we know how he responded, but, but, but what was he thinking? How, what was he feeling on the inside? What did he feel when Judas betrayed him? We, we often don't get a chance to see those innermost feelings but this passage is different. You see, in this passage, it's just as if God 
pulls back the curtain. And God allows us to see something that, that no one else has seen. We're allowed to see, we're allowed to experience this intimate conversation between God the Son and God the Father. And not only are we allowed to eavesdrop, as it were, and we're not eavesdropping because he gives us permission to do it, but we're not only allowed to hear the conversation, but we're allowed to see the innermost human feelings of Jesus. And it gives us a brief glance into his inner struggles and into his personal desires. So I just want us to see two things. If you have an outline in front of you, the first thing is this, the struggle of Gethsemane. I want us to understand what was taking place, this, the, this battle, the struggle that was taking place there in the garden. Now, 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 I'm sure if you've read the New Testament, you know that, that for Jesus, the Garden of Gethsemane was usually a place of spiritual refuge. It, it, it was just like this quiet place. If you go there today, it's like this serene, quiet place. And by the way, the Garden of Gethsemane is there today. Some of you were there uh, not long ago, and, and it's still this, this, this small little garden. They actually say that the trees there, some of them are either the trees that were there when Jesus was there, or they're the children of the trees that were there when Jesus was there. And so how cool is it to be praying in this garden that somewhat today looks like what it looked like when Jesus was there. So if you've been able to spend a few moments there, it's this, it's this serene, quiet, tranquil place. And Jesus often went there to spend time alone with the Father. But, but on this day, Gethsemane was not a peaceful place. On this day, Jesus would not experience peace and tranquility and, and this, this joyous conversation. But as we read these verses, we see Jesus experiencing some of his darkest hours. And we see Jesus fighting one of his greatest spiritual battles. And it's interesting that he would do it alone. So, so if you have your outlines, I just gave you a couple of things. I, I wrote this, Jesus agonized. So in this prayer, in this conversation with the Father, we see Jesus agonizing over his pending suffering and death. And, and you see it in, in the text. And in verse 33, it says, as he was leaving Peter, James, and John, it says, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. By the way, the, the those adjectives are not just light. Those are, those are profound adjectives that show that this was not just a light momentary distress. His soul was exceedingly troubled. He said that in verse 34. In verse 34 he says, My soul is sorrowful even unto death. Luke, Luke, um, Another gospel gives us just another glimpse. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 44, Luke describes it this way. It says, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat, you're familiar, his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. Some have viewed this as just some metaphorical, symbolic, allegorical description that the disciples give. But, 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 but I don't believe so. Jesus was praying in such agony that blood mingled with his sweat. There's actually a medical condition in which that happens. Jesus was agonizing there in the garden. You say, okay, Brian, so, so, so what was he agonizing over? What was the struggle Next thing I put in your notes is this. Jesus asked the Father, if possible, not to drink from the cup. As I mentioned, theologians have discussed, debated for years what was in the cup. And obviously, Jesus here is speaking symbolically. He didn't have a literal cup in his hand, you know, with uh, Coke in it and, and sitting back saying, okay, this isn't what I want to drink. Obviously, he was talking symbolically and he's saying, Father, listen, I don't want to drink of the cup. I don't want to participate in that which you have planned. What was in the cup? Was it the fear of suffering? Was it the fear of dying? Or was it something more mystical? 
Was it something more metaphysical? I would say this, and I'm giving you a bunch in your outline, but this is something for you to meditate on later. But I would say this, the cup represented more than the fear of human suffering. When Jesus said, Father, let this cup pass from me, I I believe he was talking about more than just physical suffering. He wasn't just saying, man, I, I dread putting that crown of thorns on my head. And I dread being beaten with a cat of nine tails. And I'm certainly not looking forward to having nails driven in my hand. I believe that was part of it. And and I would even say this. To fear death at the hands of the Romans was completely understandable. The Romans had perfected crucifixion. To, To the Romans, crucifixion wasn't just a means of execution. Catch this. To the Romans... Crucifixion was a means of torture. They they took pleasure in keeping their victim alive on the cross as long as they could. And so it wasn't just the means, wasn't just to kill this person. The, The purpose was to make this person suffer. And so if Jesus would have sat back and said, I have a father, dad, listen, man, I am not looking forward to going through all of that physically, man, we would certainly understand that, would we not? But the cup that Jesus asked the father to remove, I believe, signified much more than just human suffering. I think from a human perspective, there was a part of that, but I believe there was more there. So the second thing that I wrote in your notes is this, the cup represented God's wrath against the sin of the world. So so Jesus knew that he was not just going to suffer physically, and he would, more than you and I can imagine. But Jesus knew that he was going to suffer spiritually as well. And by the way, when he uses that phrase, this cup, He's indicating exactly what he's talking about because throughout the Old Testament, the phrase, the cup of God's wrath, is used repeatedly to talk about God's wrath on sin, God's God's anger against wicked nations. Let me give you two examples, and there are plenty of them. Isaiah 51 and verse 17, wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem. You who have drunk from the hand of the Lord, notice, the cup of his wrath. Jeremiah 25 and verse 15, thus the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me, take from my hand this cup of the wine of the wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. So when Jesus said, Father, take this cup away from me, he was using Old Testament terminology. And he was talking about what God had always prophesied that that man's sin would be atoned for. And that God in his holiness, God in his righteousness, could not condone sin. And as a result, sin would be paid for. And throughout the Old Testament, that, 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 that aspect of God's judgment was described and defined as the cup of God's wrath. So Jesus, understanding the Scriptures, because He is the Word of life, said, Father, let this cup pass from me. He wasn't just talking about physical suffering. He was talking about bearing the sin dead of the world. He was talking about my sin, and he was talking about yours. He who knew no sin became sin for us. So Jesus, the perfect, spotless Son of God, who had been tempted in every way like you and I are, yet victorious over sin, realized that in just a few hours, he not only would be beaten and crucified, and killed, but he would take upon himself the sins of the entire world, and he would bear the wrath of God. Listen, I I want you to catch this, because the suffering at the hands of the Romans was child's play in comparison to what he had to suffer for your sins and mine. 
In order for Jesus to pay the full and complete price of our sin, he would need to endure the weight of sin. He would need to endure the punishment for evil. And he would need to endure the suffering of hell. And T. Wright, a great Anglican theologian, says this. It says, Jesus had looked into the darkness and saw the grinning faces of all the demons in the world looking back at him. And he begged and he begged his father not to bring him to the point of going through it. Yet I want you to know that Jesus wasn't necessarily looking for an escape. And he wasn't out of there no matter what took place. Even though he asked for an escape, he was fully ready to do whatever was necessary to fulfill the will of the Father. Because he prayed this in verse 36. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet that phrase that we all read together, yet not what I will, but, but what you will. And so even though Jesus prayed, Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. I want you to catch this because this is so poignant. It's so powerful. Jesus obediently submitted to the will of the Father. He obediently submitted to the will of the Father. Not what I want, Dad, but what you want. I love how the writer of Hebrews describes this. Look at these verses as Hebrews describe, the writer of Hebrews describes this, this intimate moment. It says, in the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who is able, who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reference. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. <laughs> Three times, Jesus asks the Father, if it's possible, remove this cup from me. Three times, by the way, he goes back to his disciples and, and finds them sleeping. And three times, he returns to pray. And the text says in very clear terms that he prayed the same thing. He gave the same request to the Father every time. Three times, Father, if it's possible, everything is possible for you. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. A third time, if it's possible, you can do all things. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. It's interesting that Luke tells us in Luke chapter 22 that after he made the request a third time, there appeared an angel from heaven to him, strengthening him. I sat back and thought, wow, how cool is that? So here's Jesus all alone suffering and God sends an angel to Jesus to minister to him. Wouldn't it be cool to know what the angel said? R.C. Sproul says this, and it's just conjecture, but R.C. Sproul says this, he says, the angel came from heaven with the Father's answer to Jesus' prayer. The angel comes to Jesus and says, you got to drink from the cup. The father says, you must drink from the cup. There is no other way. Church, catch this. This is so deep and profound, and, I'm, and I know I've been into it all week long, and so I kind of want you to get into it like I have, but, but, but I want you to catch what is taking place at that moment. When, when Jesus says, not what I will, but what you will, at that moment, the internal, the internal battle was over. Jesus gets up from his knees, and his face is set towards Calvary. He gets up from his knees, and he's resolute. He's convicted. He knows what he has to do. As a matter of fact, look at the end of the passage. He goes back and the disciples are sleeping and he says, wake up, let's go. My betrayer's at hand. It's time to do what the Father has asked me to do. At that moment, at that moment, the battle was over. We never see him shaken or seemingly doubting again. 
He faces the humiliation, the trial, the mockery, the scourging, the crucifixion, all with a resolution and a calmness that was unshakable. Why is that? He knew it was the Father's will. And he was determined to fulfill the Father's will, whatever the cost. I think there's a victory that's won here in the Garden of Gethsemane. And by saying that, I certainly don't minimize what took place at Calvary because the devil, the enemy, sin, death, were destroyed at Calvary and ultimately in the resurrection. But the enemy was defeated in Gethsemane. You see, the battle there at Gethsemane was won. And at that moment when Jesus got up from his knees, the battle was over. Calvary was essential. The cross was essential. The tomb was essential. The resurrection was essential. But all of that now was inevitable. Jesus had won. The devil had lost. And in a sense, Gethsemane was D-Day for our salvation. As Jesus stood up, he knew exactly what he had to do. And he was determined to do it. The struggles of Gethsemane. Isn't that deep? Isn't that profound? Doesn't that want to make you raise your voice and praise the Lord? Realizing that that our sins, as deep and as profound and as, as awful as they are, were completely paid for by Jesus Christ. And He willingly, willingly took my sin and yours. And He willingly canceled that debt canceled that condemnation that was placed over us from our sin. And He willingly took upon Himself what you and I deserved so that we might experience the freedom that we have today in Jesus Christ. And it all began in Gethsemane. The struggle of Gethsemane. But, but, but in just a few moments that we have left, I want you to see that the, there's not just a theological battle that took place there. This, the, this battle between good and evil that took place there, and it most certainly did. But there are some lessons there that you and I can learn from Gethsemane. Because, because as I mentioned a few moments ago, you will have a Gethsemane moment in your life. I promise you, you will. You will have a Gethsemane moment in your life. How will you respond? Three lessons. Let me share them with you quickly. The first is this. Like Jesus, you will have nights of agony and despair. Like Jesus, you will have nights of agony and despair. Please catch this truth, church. Salvation does not free you from suffering. Oh, I wish to God, I wish I could look at you and say, man, place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ and you'll never have another problem. I wish I could look at you and say, you know what, man, become a follower of Christ and you'll never have to deal with sickness again. Become a follower of Christ and you know what? There will always be money in your bank accounts. Always. Become a follower of Jesus Christ, men, and your wife will always think that you are the greatest thing in the world. <laughs> Ladies, become a follower of Christ, and your husband is going to treat you like the queen that you deserve to be. I wish I could tell you that it's always going to be that way. But you know as well as I do, that's not the case. Salvation does not free you and I from suffering like Jesus you will experience agony. Like Jesus, you will experience despair. Like Jesus, you will experience pain. Like Jesus, you will experience suffering. So Brian, how do you know that? Well, first of all, because I live it. Secondly, in my profession, I walk with people each and every day who are experiencing suffering. 
I was at a, a lunch meeting on Friday. Jose and I were there and get a text message. Donna sends a text message and says, Brian, this lady wants to talk to you. And I called and this lady with a broken heart and a broken voice talked about the fact that she had a young adult son who attended our church, who loved HCC, struggled with some physical aspects. And just a week or so ago, he took his life. And as we talked on the phone, her heart was broken. She, she was in agony. She was in despair. I wish I could look at you and say, man, you're never going to have moments like that, and I trust that you don't experience what she experienced, but I'm here to tell you that like Jesus, you will have nights of agony and despair. Say, Brian, how do you know it? Because the Bible talks about it. John 16 and verse 33, Jesus looks at the disciples and he says this, in the world you will have tribulation. He doesn't say, listen, trust me and all of your problems will be gone. Listen, first century believers gave their lives for the gospel. He says, you will have tribulation. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12, Peter says, Don't be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. What is he saying? For the believer, persecution, trial, tribulation is a normal part of life. Now let's just pause for a second and thank God that we live in a country for which we're not persecuted to be Christians. Amen? We can meet here today and we don't have to worry about the authorities shutting the door. We don't have to worry about followers of Jesus Christ being persecuted. We don't have to worry about pastors being arrested for simply preaching the truth. Thank God we have that freedom. But let's not be confused into thinking that that's the way it is all around the world. Today, there are hundreds of Chinese pastors who are in prison for doing nothing more than I am doing this morning. There have been more martyrs in this century than all the previous centuries. <laughs> we're fortunate. I don't know why God has blessed us so much. But Peter says this, in the world you will, or Jesus said, you will have tribulation. Don't be surprised says Peter, whenever trial comes, and Peter wrote to believers who were about to go through the Neronian persecution. Matt Chandler said this, I love this quote, he said, comfort is the God of our generation. So suffering is seen like a problem to be solved rather than the providence or the plan of God. Let me show you a second truth. The second truth is this. Like Jesus, your path to victory is found in obedience to God's will. Your path to victory is found in obedience to God's will. Jesus prayed this. It's the title of our message. Your will be done. Father, it's not what I want. But it's not about what I want. It's about what you want. So your will be done. So three things. I'll give you three simple applications there. To pray your will be done is to recognize the sovereignty of God over every aspect of your life. To pray your will be done is to recognize the sovereignty of God over every aspect of your life. And we use the term sovereignty. We're talking about the fact that God is in control. I say this jokingly, but it's, but it's so true. God has never said, oops. <laughs> Nothing has ever happened in your life that God said, oh my word, how did that happen? I really didn't plan on that. How, how in the world did that happen? No. David says this, the steps of a good man are established by God. God. God is sovereign when good things happen to us, and God is sovereign when bad things happen to us. 
Hey, you say, Brian, what does that mean? It simply means what Jonas led us, or Rachel led us not long ago. We recognize our God reigns. And our God is on the throne. No matter what happens in our life, our God is on the throne. And so to pray, God, your will be done, is a recognition of the fact that God is sovereign. He is in control. Whether things seem out of control or in control, God is in control. He is on the throne today. And that is a profound theological principle for us. We don't believe one day He is going to reign. We believe He is reigning today. And he is on the throne today. God is sovereign. You can take that to the bank if you got money in the bank or you don't have money in the bank. Now, I don't recommend you go to the bank and say, listen, there's no money in the bank, but God's on the throne, so, uh, so, so give me what's mine, all right? But no matter what's happened in your life and mine, God is sovereign. It, 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 here's the thing. And it's so easy for us to believe in the sovereignty of God when everything's going right. Oh, man, God's blessing me. I'm blessing me. God's sovereign. Praise the Lord. Everything's going right. Listen, faith is the demonstration of your belief in God, not when everything's going well, but in the difficult moments of your life. When you don't understand what God is doing, when it doesn't make sense to you, to sit back and say, I trust in the sovereignty of God. Let me show you a second thing. To pray your will be done. To pray your will be done is to recognize that your will must be submitted to his will. It's to sit back and say, okay, God, you know what? Okay, here's the deal. I wanted to go right, but you want me to go left. God, I want to go forward, but you want me to go here. God, I want to do this, but God, you want me to do that. And it's sitting back recognizing, okay, in order for me to experience the peace and the joy of God, I submit myself not to what I want, but to what God wants. Now, God in His grace at times not only gives us what we need, but at times He gives us what we want. But He doesn't always do that because sometimes our wants aren't for our benefit. We want something that's not going to help us. We want something that's going to hurt us. And so, God, I want this. And God says, no, I'm not going to give that to you because I love you. It's like your child waking up in the morning and saying, you know, as a prayer request, Mommy, I want ice cream for breakfast. You have the power to do it, but you know it's not in your child's best interest to do that. And so you as a, a, a parent are going to answer their request not as they want, but what is beneficial to him or her. And God in his sovereignty knows what's best for you and I. And so submitting to his will is sitting back saying, okay, God, your plan is better than mine. God, I trust you. And I submit myself to your plan. You see, like Jesus, once you recognize that your struggle, your sickness, your loss is part of God's plan, then you can rest in his care. You can rest in his promises, realizing that his will is better than yours. Let me get extremely, extremely personal. Most of you know we have a 24-year-old disabled daughter. Amber's profoundly disabled. For 24 years, we've prayed that God would heal Amber. I believe with all of my heart that God has the power to heal her. I prayed for it this morning. Yet God in his sovereignty has chosen not to do that. So my wife and I were at peace with that. We're at peace with the fact that God's plan is better than ours. A few years ago, I was, I was preaching in Lima, Peru, and I was telling the story of, of Amber and, and uh, everything that we have gone through. And I was telling that story, and, and, I, and I told the story of the fact that we've prayed about it, and yet we trust and we believe that God's plan is better than ours. And 
some gentleman at the conclusion of the service, man, I no sooner had said amen, he was right down front and his finger was in my face and he was telling me that my daughter is not healed because I don't have faith. And if I had faith, Amber would be healed. I came this close to punching somebody in church, all right? I was really close to punching him. Huh? I was afraid they'd put me on a plane and send me home if that happened. But listen, God... God has all the power in the world. God can say, today, Amber, get up off that bed and walk and hear and talk. And I believe with all of my heart that God has the power to do that. Yet God in his sovereignty has chosen not to do that. And so we rest in the truth that God is more glorified in what she's going through than he would be, than she would be even with her healing. And it allows us to have peace. That doesn't mean that there's not difficult times. But it allows us to have peace. So to pray, God, your will be done means that I submit my plan, my wants, my everything to his. Let me give you one other thing, and i got to be done. To pray your will be done is to realize that God will not spare you from trials and tribulations. He won't. If, if that's the case, there wouldn't be any death. <laughs> That's the case no Christians would ever be persecuted. That certainly wasn't the case with the disciples. Do you know anything about church history? The same disciples to which he wrote, many of them gave their lives for him. Peter was crucified upside down. John was sent to the Isle of Patmos. James gave his life for the faith. Listen. To say, Lord, your will be done doesn't mean, okay, good, I surrendered myself to God, so now I'm not going to have any more trials and tribulations. It doesn't mean that. Rather, it's sitting back saying, okay, God, I trust you that you will use the fiery furnace to purge the impurities from my life, and you will use it to mold me and shape me into the man and the woman that you want me to be. I tell you today, I'm not the same man I was 24 years ago. Apart from the Holy Spirit of God, the greatest teacher in my life is my daughter, Amber. And God uses her on a daily basis to help me and to help Vicki become the people that God wants us to be. To pray your will be done doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials and tribulations. Let me give you one last thing. And we're done. This is so practical. Like Jesus, your peace is found in honest and passionate prayer. Like Jesus, your peace is found in honest and passionate prayer. So, so I, had a, I had a theological debate going on in my mind this week, all right, as I prayed through this passage, actually the last couple of weeks. Because I sat back, and here's what I struggled with. I struggled with, okay, Jesus is God. Amen? We know that. As God, he's omniscient. As, as being the Alpha and Omega, he was in eternity past with God the Father. I believe they're in the councils of God. They established what God was going to do to save and redeem mankind. He knew all of that. And yet here in the garden, it's like he's saying, ah, I don't like that plan we came up with. <laughs> um, and it's almost like, Wait a second, time out, Jesus. Didn't you know when you came this is what, what, what you were going to have to do? And I sat back and I, I kind of tossed around this. How could Jesus, the Son of God, not know what God the Father wanted him to do? He knew. And I realized that the struggle that is taking place is not a divine struggle. It's a human struggle. So Jesus was not only 100% God, but catch the church, he was 100% man. He was tempted in every single way like you and I are, yet without sin. Did he struggle with doubt? Did he struggle with discouragement? Did he struggle with, you fill in the blank. Here is the human side of, of Jesus, crying out to his father, saying, that I know what's about to take place. 
humanly speaking, I don't want to go through this. Here's what this does for me. Here's what it does for me. It lets me know I can be honest in my prayers. It lets me know that I don't have to fake or feign spirituality. I don't have to just use a bunch of religious terms in my prayers so that God doesn't think that I'm doubting. I can be real. I can be raw. I can be true. I can be honest in my prayers. God, I don't like this. I don't like it. As I prayed 20 some years ago, and excuse my raw transparency, God, it's not fair that my wife and I go as missionaries to Mexico and this is the way you treat us with a disabled daughter. I'm allowed to tell God that. I'm allowed. He doesn't turn me off. He doesn't say, man, what's your problem? Where's your faith? In my humanness, I'm allowed to express my pain. I'm allowed to express my passion. I'm allowed to express my honesty to my dad who loves me. But realizing at the end of the day, I'm going to sit back and say, but you know what, God? Not what I want, but what you want. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to express your heart to God. He's not going to turn you off. He's not going to call you a heretic. <laughs> He's not going to call you a blasphemer, just as those of us who are parents love having intimate conversations with our kids, even when they're struggling. Your heavenly Father loves you, cares for you, wants to know what you're going through, and like Jesus, you can be honest, you can be transparent, you can be raw in your prayer time with God but ultimately knowing, ultimately submitting to the will of God in your life. I love the transparency of Jesus' prayer. He shows that we can be honest. We can transparently share our fears, share our struggles. We can tell him that with which we're battling. We can even ask him to change the plan. <laughs> I don't like it. Change the plan. But in those moments of prayer is when our faith is strengthened. And when we're able to get up off our knees like Jesus, resolute and convicted because we know what the will of the Father is. But listen, church, prayer is a an, is an mighty instrument. Not forgetting our will done in heaven. The prayer is a mighty instrument for getting God's will done here on earth. Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? Let's have a word of prayer. Jonas is coming. I have a couple more things to do, and so Jonas is coming. So let me, uh, let me encourage you today as, as Jonas and the team come. If you're here today and there's never been a moment in which you have placed your faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and we're going to talk about this a lot in the next coming weeks, Jesus paid the debt for your sin. And Jesus desires for you to have an intimate relationship with the Father that is only possible through faith in Jesus Christ. So if you have never, by faith, reached out to Jesus and trusted him and him alone as your Lord and Savior, I'd encourage you to do that in your heart of hearts right now. We'll have some of our leaders down front that would love to have a word of prayer with you if you'd love to pray with somebody. Maybe there's a battle going on in your heart today. God's done something in your life and you're mad at him about it. It doesn't make sense to you. And today, you just want to spend a few moments either here or an altar. Grab your spouse's hand where you are. Say, God, not my will, but your, be done. your will be done. Submit to the will of God. And I promise you, as you submit to the will of God, even in the midst of your pain, 
you'll experience joy that you've never experienced before. And God will give you peace that only comes from him. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your word. Help us, Lord, to not only hear it, help us to take it and to respond to it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.